Welcome everyone um, to another edition of the Tiny ML Builds, uh, where we talk about um, how people are building things. Uh, so we have uh, Pete Warden here, uh, CEO of Use Useful Sensors. Thank you very much for taking the time um, to go through some introduction, and then after that we'll launch into um, the presentation. Okay, um, I'd like to acknowledge our uh, and thank our sponsors. Without them, this would not be possible. AI Zip, uh, Analog Devices, Arduino, ARM, BrainChip, Edge Impulse, GreenWaves, Rovetti, IBM, ImageMob, uh, Infineon, Inotera, Microsoft, Nota AI, NXP, Pauline Technology, Kixo, Qualcomm, Renaissance, Schneider, SenseML, Sony, Silicon Labs, ST, Synaptics, Sentient. And I uh, would really encourage everybody to join the really fast growing TinyML community. Uh, we have meetups that are um, remote as well as in person in uh, various locations. Uh, there's also a LinkedIn community where you can participate in some of the discussions. Um, <clears throat> there is a pretty large YouTube channel. Uh, we have a lot of videos. These are deep technical content, not just advertising type videos. And uh, there's a lot that I've learned by watching some of them. So this um, um, discussion will also be on the YouTube channel in a couple of days. So watch out for that. Um, some, uh, we, we're having the tiny ML uh, Europe, uh, Middle East and Asia, um, get together this coming week. Uh, for those of you in the area, do join. It's uh, the Tiny ML Summit here in uh, San Francisco is quite amazing. Um, I'm Venkatrangan. Um, you can go connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like to know more about me. A um, little bit about Pete. Is, uh, Pete is the CEO of Useful Sensors, a startup that builds small, low cost and private by design modules that provide machine learning capabilities like presence detection, gesture recognition, and voice interfaces. Uh, he was previously the CTO of Jetpack, which was acquired by Google in 2014, a founding member of the TensorFlow open source framework, and a technical lead for its on-device team. Until 2022, he wrote the tiny ML book from O'Reilly, teaches at Stanford, as well as pursuing a PhD in computer science there. Uh, welcome, Pete, and thank you so much for taking the time um, uh, to be with us today. Hope to have you. No, a... Thanks, Venkat. Thanks for organizing this. I'm uh, really interested to see where the discussion goes. And, and if I can add just one thing, I think Pete has done a lot of uh, cool things in, in his professional life. We are super happy to have him here today. I think there are two things that come to my mind that are really outstanding. Uh, about seven years ago, Pete presented a paper, which is a similar paper on 8-bit quantization, saying that, hey, you can do same um, inference uh, accuracy with 8 bits as with FP32. And I think now it became an industry standard. He's one of the founders and tenders of TensorFlow, which is also an uh, industry standard now. And I I'm hoping that the useful sensors will become industry standards soon, too. Well, welcome, Pete, again, and thank you for joining. Thanks, Evgeny. That's very kind. <laughs> okay. Um, so I will stop presenting at this point, and uh, let's let's get into a discussion. So um, you founded Useful Sensors last year, and uh, there was a paper that you wrote that is on. Uh, um, up, up on the web, and it's it's quite a fascinating paper because it covers a whole bunch of different topics. Um, so perhaps we can start by talking about uh, what in your mind is a useful sensor. And I'd uh, also like to take this time to um, ask the audience to ask any questions they have on the question and answer box. Yeah, so 
all of this really came about through my work with TensorFlow Light Micro, uh, because I've been fascinated by TinyML, um, and Evgeny was one of the inspirations for that with his seminal glance project at Qualcomm. Um, but the thing that really fascinated me was that it enables things like I want to be able to look at a lamp and say on and have the lamp come on. Um, or I want to be able to get up from my TV and have it automatically pause so I don't have to find the remote every time. Um, but when I talked to light switch companies and, you know, companies that make TVs um, and a lot of these uh, companies that make these kinds of uh, everyday objects, um, I would tell them all about this free open source project um, and documentation and conferences and books and online courses. And at the end of it, they would say, look, we barely have a software engineering team. <laughs> we're not gonna have we're not gonna put together a machine learning team. Um, can you just give me something that gives me a voice interface? Or can you just give me something that tells me when somebody sits down in front of my TV? Um and so fundamentally useful sensors and is an attempt to kind of answer that request and give manufacturers something that's really easy to integrate. Um, you know, I've got one of the person sensors that we, uh, you know, we make here, uh, which you could buy on Spark Fun for like ten dollars. Um, uh, not to plug this too much, <laughs> but uh, you know, and what it does is uh, it it can act just as a replacement for a PIR motion sensor. It's got one pin that goes high whenever there's a person around. Um, and then it's got an I2C interface, which gives you information about where the people are, does some face recognition um, and things like that. So useful sensors, it's kind of like, we're trying to live up to the name um, and actually produce modules that use ML under the hood, but um, are really easy for people to integrate, especially manufacturers. Okay, so uh, I think uh, what you're getting at is you're going to treat the entire ML sensor, all of that, something like the way we treat uh, an accelerometer or a gyro. The details of the MEMS and all that huge complexity is hidden away behind a standard interface. Exactly. And um really trying to save people from having to learn about machine learning and in all its complexity uh, just to get some basic capabilities. Okay. So that brings up a bunch of questions, right? With an accelerometer, it's clear what we're measuring. It's a uh, when it's, you, you turn it one way, it's it's uh, acceleration due to gravity. You know exactly what that is. What is the equivalent of that in ML? What is it that you're measuring really? In? Well, it's funny that you mentioned the accelerometer because one of the inspirations is actually that you get accelerometers now, which not only give you the raw acceleration values, they actually give you the... Um, uh, orientation in space which is quite a complex cal software calculation on top of the raw kind of accelerometer values um so uh in a similar way what we're trying to do is figure out what products and applications actually need and if there are any common um kind of types of actionable information um, that they're looking for. So, for example, is there a person there? Um, you know, that's that's a very common um, requirement. Um, and then, like, you know, maybe which family member is it? So you can do personalization and trying to really work backwards from application requirements, these product requirements, and figure out which ones can be addressed with a single sensor that is... Um, is reusable across a whole bunch of different products. 
So the challenge uh, with building any of these systems is really the detailed applications, right? It's very easy to have a toy model that says, okay, yeah, there's a person there. But in the field, when it's deployed, there's, it depends on lighting. Uh, let's take the person sensor, right? Because you, you have that. So it will be great to understand uh, when people put this, when a developer takes this little module and puts it on the wall, if they put it up high on the wall versus low on the wall, or maybe in the roof, it, the definition of a person, I think to you and me as a human being is very clear. But the definition of a person for an ML model, how do you make that reliable and robust across all these different variations? That's that's a great question. And it's actually um, something that the um, team uh, useful has had to uh, deal with because um, the initial person sensor uh, is actually looking for faces. So it's really designed to work within, you know, a couple of meters for something like, a, you know, a laptop or something where you're walking up to a device. Um, but then we had people who want to put these in like air conditioning units up in the corner of a room um, or on a TV so that they can actually do audio sort of beamforming or something like that. And that really requires that you do whole body detection and uh, you also have lots of different angles, um, you know, and you may also have a fisheye lens. Um, so the team have spent a lot of time actually trying to gather data for those particular variations. Um, and one thing we've actually been trying to do is we have a phone app that lets um, our customers that we're working with actually take um, photos of situations where our model is getting the wrong answer and just submit them over the web. So um, it lets them submit false positives and false negatives. Uh, you know, for example, a lot of models actually don't recognize a person when you're looking at them sideways if they're sitting on a couch. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, which uh, which is an interesting. So being able to get some images of that sort of situation is really helpful. And then uh, on the other side, a lot of models actually mess up when you have a chair with a coat coat hung on the back. Almost every model we've you know public model we've tested thinks that that's a person. Um, so having some examples of um, that as a false positive um, is really helpful. But then what we're uh, working on is actually trying to then use those um, like hard, uh, you know, sort of hard examples of, um, you know, mistakes and then do searches using image embeddings for similar images that we can actually, uh, so we can multiply the human captured images with similar images that we, you know, from these larger uh, public um, image data sets. Um, and then we can manually label those and feed them into the um, training data set. Um, okay. and we can also use those mistakes, um, those individual images as part of a test set almost as like unit tests, like do we handle the coat on a chair problem well yet? Um, so that's that's been some of the practical learning that we've we've had around trying to really make our data sets more robust. Okay, we have a question, uh, which is uh, which part of the sensor does the computing part? How is the ML? model stored, computed, or used within the sensor in the PCB? Is it an ASIC? No. Um, we're really trying to start off with off-the-shelf components for this. Um, at the moment, for this person sensor V1, it's actually a HiMax uh, Synopsis Arc DSP uh, that we've got on the back of the chip here that's running all of the algorithms. Um, and then there's a... Oh, I just dropped it, luckily. 
they're fairly cheap. Um, <laughs> this is also a Hymax camera on the front. Um, so uh, we actually have, um, uh, you know, quite a nice little DSP um, where we're able to run like a face recognition, a face detection model that's like 400 kilobytes, and then also a face recognition model that's another 400 kilobytes. So the output of this is, uh, you mentioned a single pin uh, and a little bit of an I2C, uh, some data going over it. And your paper covered quite a bit of detail on why you made these design choices. So do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, so number one was to make it as easy to integrate for um, manufacturers of everyday objects as possible. Um, and I squared C was the obvious choice because pretty much every um, every SOC, every microcontroller and DSP um, can actually, uh, you know, has some I squared C capability. People are very comfortable at integrating it into their um, devices. Um, and it's also nice because it's a it's a fairly um doesn't have particularly high bandwidth um so it's pretty straightforward to be able to um you know it's a nice way of restricting how much information can leave the chip in a kind of a, a very natural way um they were uh, i i think i should have rephrased my question which Sorry. is the physical interface is one but there's also a choice you made to at least in the paper that you call out where you don't want the sensor to be updatable in the field, right? Exactly. That's a huge, uh, uh, you, you're really putting yourself out there and saying, I will not do that. It's a pretty extreme position and it really, um, it, it definitely, uh, a lot of engineers um, get uncomfortable because you, you clearly have software running on this device and we're saying, oh, but you can't update it. And people are like, well, you know, what if there's a bug? What if there's a problem? Um, the, the key thing is that this is a very, like this is dealing with very sensitive data. It's dealing with uh, raw camera information, like video recording. Um, and there, that's something that people are understandably very nervous about having a camera in everyday devices. It's creepy. Um, so in order to, um, you know, earn and deserve their trust, uh, we go to a lot of lengths to actually get our uh, system, whole system, the whole module verified uh, by third parties that, um, you know, there is no, um, there are no backdoors, there are no harmful um, ways that, uh, you know, and a, a malicious uh, hacker or even a system builder can actually get access to the raw camera data. Um, if we allowed updates, then it would be very hard to maintain those guarantees. Um, because it means that there are a lot more combinations and permutations of, um, you know, firmware update, you know, firmware versions. And it's very hard to have a nutrition label essentially on the outside of the device, you know, the whole product saying, hey, this, this only tells you if there are people present, if you can then, you know, upload a new model or new software that does something completely different that users might not consent to when they buy the device. Um, so, uh, and also I I just hate firmware updates, um, you know, on on any consumer devices that I that I have. It's it's it feels really frustrating, you know, like I have a Philips Hue light system and the bridge when I get a new bridge and I have to set it up, I have to wait 10 minutes for it to, it's mandatory that I basically wait 10 minutes for it to flash 
a new upgrade to the system and that's that's just you know it's really unfriendly to users generally to just be doing firmware upgrades on consumer devices I, I suspect there's a lot of engineers who are not going to be happy. They're going to say, hey, you know what? I wish uh, you just gave me this little capability to do, just open it up a little bit. Let me do a little bit here and I can build my system. But um, those are probably not the right people for the sensor in some sense. Yeah. And I, I really, you know, I love Edge Impulse. Um, you know, I think I, you know, I obviously love just playing with TensorFlow like Micro directly. Um, you know, there are a lot of great resources. There's like Arduino um, integrations and integrations with Raspberry Pi, Picos and, you know, ESP32s, all sorts of um, different devices out there where you can play with the raw software. Um, and I love it when people do that. This is more aimed at um, people who aren't yet ready to kind of dive into all of the complexities of ML um, and trying to sort of offer something to that market. Um, so that's that's really, and you know, the other thing is like, you, you don't generally do a firmware upgrade on an accelerometer, um, even though there's a bunch of software running in there. So I'm hoping we can kind of be more in that category. Okay. Um, I think we got a question that's a little bit, uh, uh, two questions really that are connected to this. Uh, one might be easier for you, which is uh, how do you train your board for facial recognition? So I'm not sure if the question is really referring to your internal process or if it is external facing. Well, one question that comes up a lot is, do you have to do training on the board itself to do things like facial recognition. Um, and we do not. Um, we actually use uh, embeddings as the output of the model. And then we do clusterings of embeddings to actually figure out where, um, you know, how to do which face belongs to which person. Um, so that doesn't involve any back propagation. It's, and it's also, it's, it's similar to, if you look at the FaceNet paper from Google, um, which I think came out in 2015 or something like that, um, that describes kind of a, a similar sort of system. You get a signature for the face um, and you just use that then using traditional like nearest neighbor lookup algorithms. Okay. And uh, kind of connected with that is, uh, so uh, there is, just to be clear, users do not have the capability based for a variety of reasons laid out in your paper to be able to train and send the model over to the sensor. This is purely designed as a very clear interface uh, for privacy security uh, that you cannot change the model. Once, it's, once you buy the thing, that's it. It is what it is. Okay, yeah. so uh, the related question is, uh, what are the short-term business and commercial objectives of this first product, or is it purely made to test the waters? <laughs> so um, really the, uh, you know, we're trying to do a couple of things. Fundamentally, as a startup, we need to find customers. Um, and uh, it's been fantastic seeing the response of like the maker community. Uh, we've ended up with not only, uh, you know, individual makers, but also people um, who run, uh, who build technology for major theme parks um, have actually uh, been buying them off Sparkfun, people at some major uh, museums uh, around the world have actually picked up these devices and started using them. Um, so getting the person sensor out there in October was uh, really, really helpful just to start to see all of the ways that people um, would use, you know, could and would use something like this because it is very new. Um, 
we're also uh we've actually got a distribution deal with rs components um to help us get um these future versions of these you know person sensor we've got a um a low cost uh, very small qr code reader um that we're bringing out soon we've got the speech to text um uh work ongoing um and a new version of the person sensor um they're going to be uh released through rs components um who will be able to distribute them worldwide um so that we're really hoping to we've been seeing that that helps us reach a bunch of um smaller industrial companies um and then we're in direct conversations with a bunch of big consumer electronics companies so we're we're doing everything we can to um both find makers and small industrial sort of and small commercial companies um but also uh work with some of the big players in the consumer electronics world so it seems like what you have now is uh, really something you're putting it out there getting feedback uh, there there will be many other different modalities that are different senses that the useful sensor will end up with. Okay. Um, to get back to some of the principles you laid out in your paper, uh, you talked about um, the uh, balance between flexibility, modularity, and the update capability, if I could rephrase it. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it seems like this is uh, these are the principles laid out uh, in, in the paper are would serve pretty much anybody trying to build such a device. It, it really depends, like a big part of the requirements that we set ourselves, um, because we see this um, being really important is privacy. So um, having everything be very modular, um, it might actually be overkill for um, some other types of applications. Like maybe you, if you've got something, you know, if you've got a um, something in, for example, a, a vacuum cleaner, say, that's just looking at the floor, maybe you don't care about the privacy aspects of that camera. So you don't need to do nearly as much work to kind of ring fence it from the rest of the system. Um, and you could have more of the algorithms running on a single SOC that does all sorts of other kind of network connectivity and uh, user facing kind of app type stuff. So the modularity that we chose is um, is really driven by the fact that we want to sell the same module to a bunch of different customers, uh, but also really having these strong privacy guarantees. So if you're building your own uh, device, um, you'll need to kind of look at what the actual requirements are around uh, things like privacy. Like, you know, if you have something like a doorbell camera, people know there's a camera there, it's facing out the public street, you and they expect that images will be kind of transmitted up to the cloud um maybe that's an area where you don't actually need those same um privacy guarantees and you can make different engineering trade-offs and maybe run on the main processor that also has like kind of a network stack and everything else um so i wouldn't take the way that we're doing things as a um as the only way to that I recommend building uh, stuff, we're we're kind of making life hard for ourselves in the hope that we have something reusable um, and uh, that's able to be um, sold and used by a bunch of different uh, product manufacturers. Okay. That's that's uh, fair. I think one of the comments that came by just when uh, was that by not updating firmware, don't you create uh, electronic waste? <laughs> oh no, I'm very uh, yeah. I 
the internet of trash um, is something that concerns me a lot. Um, I'm, I think that there are, um, well, first off, most of the um, products that we're part of um, or hope to be part of are things like audio equipment, TVs, um, uh, appliances. These aren't things that are typically updated um, or have a particularly long uh, life in the consumer world. So um, there we don't make the problem any worse, at least. Um, but in general, once, especially once we get to battery powered things or energy harvesting powered devices, um, then we have the potential to have, uh, you know, these devices scattered literally kind of, you know, through fields or in built environments. And there we risk having this kind of layer of my nightmare is this layer of kind of tiny ML modules in the geological record. Um, <laughs> like we have kind of like a layer of plastic kind of and everything else developing right now. Um, so I would love, you know, I've been trying to um, do some work and do some writing on how we can actually identify and pick up um, abandoned uh, you know, smart dust, essentially. Um, and I think that there's there's some ways to do that with, you know, even having things like deposits on these devices that get returned when they're handed in um, or make it, well, and making them easier to find, making sure that they're like magnetically um, pick upable, for example, um, to make kind of finding them in, in trash a lot easier so yeah no i'm i am that's one of my concerns is we're we're going to have this proliferation of tiny devices um and i don't want them to become pollution uh, at the same time i think there are many applications which don't require updates right our the assumption as engineers is that we keep updating things in the field but <laughs> if you have an automatic meter reader uh, and you're digitizing the dials for example Dials are not going to change, so it doesn't make sense to update it. And there's a huge number of such applications. Yeah, exactly. And I, I feel like it's it's taking an option away from engineers, which is why it's so um it and it it's taking it away in what seem can seem like an arbit for arbitrary reasons, which I think is why a lot of people react, a lot of engineers react strongly to this. But um, I think when you actually start using it in practice and in product situations, um, you know, if a person sensor is working well enough today, then hopefully there won't be too much drift in the domain. Um, you know, the counter example is like people suddenly started wearing masks, you know, yes. back in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that would have thrown things off. Um, but generally, we're hoping that person detection um, is something that if you have a good model today, that model should still work well 10 years from now. And uh, I guess another example would be the QR code reader that you are building, that you talked about. A, there's a certain set of QR codes. Those are not going to change. So you yeah. make, what you're doing is optimizing for that particular use case. Exactly. Trying trying to find use cases where there are both repeat where it's both repeatable across a bunch of domains and where things don't change very fast. Mm. Okay. There's some much more detailed questions here. Um, um, yeah, just uh, thank you, audience, for asking questions. It's, uh, it's great to get engagement. Um, Please keep the questions coming. So one of the questions is a little bit more detailed uh, by Ian um, about the false positives on object detection. Can integrating an anomaly detector that triggers whenever the confidence level of a prediction falls below a predetermined value help to curb, if not eliminate, false positives? The anomaly detector, for example, on a person detection model can be trained to find all the wrongs in a field 
like head missing in the case of a coat hanging on a chair issue. And then depending on a predetermined threshold, the normally detector can either second or overrule what the, out the output of the person detector. Can this approach reduce cases of false positives? That's a really interesting idea. I haven't seen that, um, you know, I haven't seen that before. Um, and maybe if there's any uh, paper on this sort of approach, I'd love to see it shared in the chat and I'd love to check it out myself. Um, in general, um, my first, um, the first thing I try and do is go back to the training data and just kind of double down on improving the training data because it gets very, um, once you have two models in a row um, as part of a system, it can be very unclear, like which model you should focus the most time on um, and which model is responsible for, um, you know, it's, is the, is going to be the most responsive to changes to increase the quality. Um, so I generally, I try to steer clear of having sort of two models in succession. Um, just because I, honestly, I get confused um, when I'm trying to sort of optimize and kind of increase the accuracy uh, with those because there are already so many hyperparameters uh, involved in models that, you know, we choose fairly arbitrarily and putting two models um, next to each other uh, just means that you end up with even more kind of choices about architecture and hyperparameters and things. Um, and I find that one of the hardest things to figure out is, hey, how do we actually um, decide which layers go into a model, like what the filter sizes are, um, you know, how much compute resources to put into the model to get uh, the results we want. So, um, it sounds like an interesting idea. It kind of makes my head hurt a little bit, I guess, when I think about um, debugging and um, uh, doing kind of the system design for that. Uh, Kenny, I'm not sure if you were interested in answering a little bit as well, because I saw you raised your. No, no, that's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, I think also along the same lines, uh, uh, person detector is, if you call it a person, if you call our concept is one of a visual human being, but uh, a thermal sensor, for example, gives you a very different view. So uh, going along the same lines of that question is uh, multimodal perception, right? So is uh, is it a possibility for one of your products to really pull all that together, increase confidence by using a thermal as well as normal visual spectrum, as well as audio, for example, and say, now I'm really sure this is a person. Plus it's privacy preserving. Yeah, yeah, and I do, I do find um, using uh, that kind of multimodal approach, even like, uh, you know, potentially using multiple microphones to locate where a person is from, you know, if they're speaking, for example, together with the um, uh, audio, uh, together with the video um, inputs, or yeah, using different spectrums uh, together with each other. Um, doing that kind of sensor fusion is definitely a um, powerful approach um, and one of my favorite papers, um, I helped work on an implementation of this running on a phone, but uh, back in 2018, looking to listen was an example of doing lip reading, essentially with um, video. Uh, so identifying faces and then running a model um, so that you could actually pick out individual audio tracks from a single microphone. Uh, when multiple people were talking over each other. So by using a single microphone plus the video input, you can do a really good job on this kind of source separation that traditionally requires a lot more 
um, audio engineering. Uh, one of the questions is, are you looking at exploring other domains, audio keyword spotting or image classification of other objects aside from people? I think you partially answered that already. So. Yeah, so there's, um, uh, we do see uh, some common requests come up for different, you know, object types, whether it's things like, hey, we want to identify different animals um for example or different products you know like cans um or other sort of you know packets like that um and that could be an area where we come out with a you know a single sensor that's able to do a lot of that um and uh so yeah there's uh there's definitely some um uh, some space to expand there when it comes to I actually am very, um, I spent a lot of time on keyword spotting for audio, uh, for speech. And I've, what it's turned out is that it actually tends to be very hard to use in practice because um, the false positives, like unless you have somebody pressing a button before they say the keyword, which is kind of makes the interface a lot more natural. There's a lot of, uh, um, words that are going to trigger um, that aren't actually the keywords that people will be saying in normal conversation. Um, so this is why we've uh, gone more towards the full, having full speech to text on a little module so that you can actually extract full sentences um, and hopefully do a better job, even if you're just doing keyword extraction, because you have the context of the sentence to understand, um, you know, which words are actually being said when they were very similar, um, you know, like off and of um, are often confused. But if you see them in a sentence, um, it's a lot more likely that it's going to pick the right um, variation. Um, so for the speech, uh, we're definitely, I'm definitely very excited about just using full speech to text instead of uh, keyword recognition. I think that's going to enable us to do a lot better um, interfaces around voice. So in that case, what you're, uh, please let me know if I'm getting it right. What you've decided to do is you will cut off at the text part of it. You're not going to interpret the text and take action on that. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question because um, if you think about, you know, I've been saying, hey, we we keep all of the privacy sensitive data on the module. If we have a full speech to text sensor, then the transcripts of what you've your conversations are pretty much as sensitive and in some ways kind of more sensitive than just the raw audio, because they're a lot easier for kind of malicious parties to work with and do searches through and things like that so what i'm expecting is that there will be there will be some applications where you're doing things like closed captions um where you want to have the full uh speech to text and you want that full transcript but what i'm hoping is that we actually are able to do a lot of the um processing of turning speech into actionable information um on the sensor itself. So in that case, if you imagine a speech sensor that's designed for a lamp, you might feed in, you know, a few example phrases for, hey, these are the kind of phrases that I would like to listen out for, for um, turning on a lamp and for turning off a lamp, you know, like switch lights on, switch lamp on, you know, turn lights on, lights on, lamp on. Um, and then use some natural language understanding sort of embeddings and things on the chip itself to just say, hey, I heard one of those phrases that means turn the lights on. And that could be passed over I squared C and be a lot less um, intrusive and privacy, um, you know, uh, a lot less privacy risk um, than if 
the rest of the system is getting a full transcript of what you're saying and will also hopefully be easier for consumer manufacturers to deal with because then they don't have to write a whole natural language understanding stack on top of this transcript. So I think what your the common thread seems to be that you're prioritizing prioritizing privacy over yes. um, everything else because that that is the main focus of what you're doing, really. Yeah, and it's it's a little tricky because um, like privacy is something that will stop people from buying something if they think that it's going to spy on them, but it's not a very strong positive um like very few people actually you know go to um look for privacy as the first or you know one of the top priorities when they're buying a product um you know most people are looking at price and functionality um and other things like that and privacy only comes up if they think that something creepy will happen if they you know something bad will happen if they buy this so i think it's partly just our obligation as engineers to think about privacy and try and design systems that have privacy built in um even though it's not a strong selling point um and that's where the you know the ease of use the integration the fact that these devices using on device ml they work as soon as you plug them into the wall socket you don't have to do kind of wi-fi setup and a whole app on your phone to get things running um that's what i'm hoping will actually sell this approach and then you know we're kind of living up to our professional obligations as engineers by making sure we actually have the privacy as buttoned down as we can uh, I think uh, this uh, this same theme was there at the previous tiny email bills with the salient folks where they talked about the, your uh, doorbell camera being required to have privacy because e even though it's looking at the street, those people have not really given consent to be yeah. included, to be photographed. So what you're doing is really taking a different approach where you're just saying, I will not use that at all therefore i'm privacy compliant uh, it, it seems like there's a stronger movement to really go and drain in some of these the corporations trying to gather data and use it for their own use yeah and i you know one of the key things for me was at google especially when i worked on voice people would always ask me hey is google spying on you know my my audio my voice and i was able to say you know hand on my heart no because i've worked on that code we just don't even have the the room or the technical capability to do the things that people are worried about um but i can't prove it so uh i really think that anything we can do to make the systems we're building checkable and auditable um I think is a really important thing for us to be uh, working on. I guess I'm I'm a little bit cynical in that I don't expect anybody's going to actually reward us commercially for doing that necessarily, uh, because that's just not, you know, the con I think I saw a survey saying 78% of Americans think their speech assistant is spying on them, but like 42% of Americans still use speech assistants. So clearly... The convenience is outweighing the concerns in those cases. Um, so it's not enough to just rely on market pressures to um, push privacy. I really think there has to be both our professional um, obligations as engineers and also hopefully, honestly, regulation. Um, you know, I talked to somebody involved in EU data regulation last year um, and she just said, oh, I'm, you know, I just wouldn't buy anything with a camera in it. And my question to her was like, well, how do you know it has a camera in it? There's no obligation right now to even label that. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a complicated topic. 
there's a related question, which is how do you handle security and can your sensor model module be compromised? Um, uh, yes, it can. I think, you know, nothing we build is ever going to be 100% um, secure. What I want to do is try and have security in depth. So, you know, the idea with this is that um, it's going to be easier to just break in and add your own little tiny camera um that's doing recording uh if you have physical access to the device than it is to compromise this um so uh you know we're relying on the socs and kind of tvs and other devices to have their own um defenses against being hacked um and there but then even if the main soc gets hacked we've tried to design this so there's yet another hurdle to overcome before you can access the really um uh the really sensitive uh raw camera data because of the i square c interface it's a very slim interface getting video out of it is like okay really not worth doing exactly and we tried to design the hardware and the firmware so that there's uh there's no easy route for getting access there's no back door to that uh video data okay um i think we're running a little bit low on time so i would uh, like to really get any last thoughts you might have no i mean i'd love if if there are any last questions i'm happy to answer those but this has been uh, a really interesting set of questions uh thanks to everyone in the audience and thanks you thanks to you venka and evgeny and olga for helping run this so folks uh there is a poll out so please feel free to go ahead and um, um enter your uh, answers to that. I'd like to thank you, Pete, for a very interesting discussion. Hope to see some of your newer, uh, the QR code and the speech to text, and many more different interesting sensors. And hope to get some samples and play with them. And, and I was going to say my uh, email is pete at usefulsensors.com in case anybody. Um, wants to uh follow up on any of these uh questions i'll just put that quickly into the chat um so feel free everyone to reach out to me and uh you know if you have anything you'd like to follow up on thank all our uh, the audience for participating um and also the strategic partners that we have here uh, to really help us um, AI Zip, Analog Devices, Arduino, Arm, Brain Chip, Edge Impulse, Green Waves, Gravity, IBM, Magimob, Infineon, Inaterra, Microsoft, Nota AI, NXP, Polyn Technology, Kixo, Qualcomm, Renesas, Schneider, SenseML, so Silicon Labs, ST, Synaptics, and Sentient. Um, our executive strategic partners are Edge Impulse. Uh, Qualcomm AI Research, Sentient, uh, Platinum, Platinum Strategic Partners, uh, Renesas, Atrios, Gold Strategic Partners, Analog Devices, Arduino, Arm, Infineon, Inutera, Microsoft, SenseML, ST, Synaptics, and uh, Silver Strategic Partners up here on the screen. Thank you very much, and uh, hope to see you at the next TinyML Builds.